Hello, and welcome to this week's message from Orange Friends Church in Lewis Center, Ohio. We're glad you're with us today. If you'd like more information about Orange Friends Church, visit our website at orangefriendschurch.org. Good morning, everybody. It's so good to see you. Would you take your Bibles and open them to the last chapter in the Gospel according to Matthew. Matthew chapter 28. Now Jim was giving a good accounting of all the things that took place in the week between Palm Sunday and Resurrection Sunday. And in that grouping, one of the things that I would add to that was how the three plots of people trying to get rid of Jesus, the three plots, the one of the priests, the one of the Pharisees, the one of the Sanhedrin, how those three plots all came together in their conspiracy to kill off Jesus. And it all was able to come together because one of Jesus' own disciples, Judas, was willing to sell him out for 30 pieces of silver. And when he sold him out and Jesus was arrested and beaten and tried and put on the cross and there he died, everybody that was plotting against him was happy. They were happy because he finally was out of their hair. Jesus had been causing them trouble for years. He would preach from the word of God and make sense of things that they only tried to make more confusing. If they could confuse it enough, then people would say, man, those Pharisees, they're really smart. And I don't know what they're talking about, but boy, there's something there about God that I need to pay attention to. All they tried to do is make it more confusing. Jesus made it more simple. People started responding. They didn't like that. When Jesus would go around and he would help people and heal people and touch people's lives. They didn't like it because they weren't able to bring all that kind of joy into their uh, people's lives. All they were interested in was seeming to bring joy into their own lives by being able to say, well, I'm better than all these other slobs over here. And I, I wear these nice robes and I, I look pretty sharp and I, by golly, I think I am pretty sharp. And they, they, all they could do is think about themselves, and here is Jesus. All he could do is think about other people. And so when all of those people uh, got to the cross and knew that Jesus was dead, they were happy about that because now life can return to normal. They can get back to their business of, of making people think that they're pretty godly people when they really weren't. And they could look like they were pretty sharp when really they were just, uh, well, Jesus called them uh, whitewashed sepulchers. Uh, they looked good on the outside, but inside they were full of uh, uh, decay and wickedness. They thought the story was over. But as we know today, the story was not over. Amen? There was more to come. And that's where we're going to pick up the reading this morning in Matthew chapter 28, reading from verse 1. After the Sabbath, at dawn, on the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary went to look at the tomb. There was a violent earthquake... For an angel of the Lord came down from heaven and going to the tomb, rolled back the stone and sat on it. His appearance was like lightning and his clothes were white as snow. The guards were so afraid of him that they shook and became like dead men. The angel said to the women, do not be afraid, for I know that you are looking for Jesus who is crucified. He is not here. He has risen. Just as he said, come and see the place where he lay. Then go quickly and tell his disciples he has risen from the dead. 
and is going ahead of you into Galilee. There you will see him now, I have told you. So the women hurried away from the tomb, afraid yet filled with joy, and ran to tell his disciples. Suddenly, Jesus met them. Greetings, he said. They came to him, clasped his feet, and worshipped him. Then Jesus said to them, Do not be afraid. Go and tell my brothers to go to Galilee. There they will see me. Let's pray. Jesus, thank you for this story and the reality of it that still touches our lives today and every day as we follow you. We praise you for that story. We praise you for living in our lives. And we love you today, Lord. Thank you for speaking to us from here again. In Jesus' name, amen. There was uh, an Easter several years ago. We were at the Deerfield Friends Church, and Stan Shilliday was a teenager who thought he would maybe be studying for the ministry. So we had Stan lined up to speak to us at a sunrise breakfast service. Sunrise breakfast service would often start and uh, stop in a, a half hour's time. It was a shorter service. And so we did a little singing and introduced Stan. Stan Shilliday got up there and he is reading this story. And he said, after the Sabbath at dawn, on the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary went to look at the tomb. He said, that was on the first day of the week. I don't know why we celebrate it on Sunday. He always thought it was the Monday was the first day of the week. That's when we go to work. That's not the first day of the week. And then when he realized what he had said, that the calendar starts Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, Sunday is the first day of the week. When he realized that, then right there in front of everybody, he is blushing 14 shades of red, you know. It was a great experience. Just one of those Easter's that stand out in our minds. Uh, and you've got a, a bunch of those kind of memories, I'm sure, as well. But when you read this story, put yourself in the place of these two ladies that went to the tomb. It says here that it was Mary Magdalene and the other Mary. Mary was a pretty common name. There were two of them in this uh, story. And they are going down to the tomb. But things, when they got there, were not what they expected. Let me share with you a little bit of what they expected it to be like. Because there was a ritual that they would go through. There was a practice that they observed. They did it again and again with every passing relative. They would have a tomb. A tomb was not just a, a hole in the ground. It was not just that kind of, of a, a final resting place. They would have, because there were so many rocks over there and mountainous rocks, they would cut out tombs. I've been in a couple of those when I went to school over there. And you go into the tomb and you walk in and it's like walking into a room. And when you walk into this room, there would be a bench area over here, and that is where they would lay the body of the deceased. And then off to the side, there would be a series of shelves. And you wonder, what are the shelves for? Well, it was all part of the practice. So that as the body was being laid in the tomb on the day of death, the process would begin that would take sometimes several months. And they would wait a couple of days. And after a couple of days, they would go into the tomb and they would bring these spices with them. It's a different way of saying it was like chemicals. They would bring these chemicals in to anoint the body that was laying there on the bench. The chemicals were not to act as any kind of a preservative, though. It was more of a deterioration. It was to accentuate the decay. So that as the, the flesh, everything began to kind of go away, what would be left would be the skeleton. So some months later, when everything is gone except the skeleton, they would go in and they would gather up the skeleton and they would bundle it. 
and a bundle would be about as long as, as the bottom of your, your leg, because that's your longest bone. And they would gather it up and they would bundle it together and they would take this bundle of, of bones over to the shelves and put it in the shelves. Now, there would usually be other bones on those shelves. What bones? Of their fathers, grandfathers, their ancestors. So when you read in the Bible, especially in the Old Testament, that so-and-so died and they were gathered unto their fathers, that's what that is all about. It was the practice of not filling up cemetery after cemetery after, you know, acre after acre of land. It was an economy of effort, an economy of space to be able to help and assist in ashes to ashes and dust to dust with those anointing of spices and chemicals so that they could gather it up and they could return to be beside their fathers. So these ladies are going to the tomb that day and that's what they are expecting to go into the tomb and to have those spices and anoint the body as a way of assisting in getting Jesus ready to return to his fathers, so to speak. When they went in, it had been a day or so, a couple days anyway, later. And they knew, because they'd done this before, that this was not going to be a pleasant experience. It was not going to be a pleasant experience because this was somebody they cared about who passed. And they would have those memories. There would also be the problem of the decay taking place already. In 2010, it was uh, January 12th of 2010, there was a violent earthquake in Haiti. And because so much of uh, the last 20 years I had spent in Haiti, I was able to, uh, to go there fairly soon after the earthquake. The earthquake had killed over a quarter million people. They had mass graves on the road that goes out to our mission headquarters, uh, off on the left-hand side of the road. There was a crack in the road when I was driving out to our mission. Um, by going through that experience, I can tell you uh, the smells of death are horrendous. You don't want to be around that. It's like nothing else in the world. You ever have a mouse or a squirrel die somewhere on the walls of your house? And you think, oh, I hope no company comes over for at least a month because it's going to smell in here for a month, getting rid of the smell of this mouse or this squirrel. That kind of, in a little way, lets you know kind of what they were expecting. So they go down to this tomb, and it didn't turn out the way they expected. For the first thing, the, the stone in front had been rolled away. It was like a wheel in a trough, and you could roll it this way, you could roll it this way. Now, if you've ever wondered, why did they make it so they could roll it back and forth like that? It's a tomb. He's buried, let it go. Well, it was because there was so much going in and going out, they had to have a way of getting in and out. And so the, the stone had been rolled away from the opening. And they would have thought, that's really weird. How did that happen? Did the soldiers do it? Did some other disciples come? How did this happen? And as they got up there, we read what happened. Well, here's this violent earthquake in verse 2. An angel of the Lord came down from heaven and going to the tomb, rolled back the stone and sat on it. An angel rolled that stone away. His appearance, the angel's appearance, was like lightning. And his clothes were white as snow. The guards were so afraid of the angel that they shook and became like dead men. They fainted. They fainted. How could they picture this is an angel? They knew this was not like any other person. They fainted. 
There's a lot of fear around angelic appearances in the Bible. And for every one of them, the angel always says the same opening line. Do not, do not be afraid. You're exactly right. Because when you meet up with an angel, that fear strikes you like, uh-oh. And they say, don't be afraid. And so these soldiers even were afraid enough that they fainted. It says in verse uh, well, it started verse five, the angel said to the women, "Do not be afraid." Um, oh, I almost lost it. Here, verse eight. So the women hurried away from the tomb, afraid, yet filled with joy. They had just had the message given to them by an angel from heaven. He is not here. He has risen, as he said. They were afraid. What's this mean? What's it like to meet up with an angel? What's going to happen now? They're a little bit afraid and a little bit excited. Kids, you ever go to a ride at the fair or maybe up to Cedar Point or down at Kings Island? And you think about getting into that ride, and you're thinking, oh, it's going to go awful fast, it's going to go awful high, but I can't turn around and go home. This is what I came here for. And you get on like, I'm, I'm looking forward to be scared to death. <laughs> <laughs> so they go into the ride, and they, they have the time of their lives. And they get off, and they say, I want to do it again, do it again, do it again. <laughs> Well, these ladies were afraid, yet filled with joy. They had that mixture there, and they ran to tell the disciples what had happened. I want to say to you today that this was the turning point in all of history. The turning point in all of history. Never since the day of creation has planet Earth ever seen anything like this before. To have someone who says, I have the power to lay my life down and to take it up again. And he demonstrated that. He gave his life on the cross. He gave it before they came along and stuck him with the spear. He gave it himself. And here on the day of resurrection, he had the power. He brought himself back to life again. They'd never seen anything like this before. And I want you to think about all the things that changed because of that day. Even immediately, think about the things that changed. Think about the people who were part of the plot to kill Jesus. They couldn't wait to get rid of him. They were just looking for the right moment. And they snatched their moment when Judas stepped forward. And they thought they were rid of him. Here's Jesus. Not only is he alive, he's back to life. And these people are thinking, oh, what are we going to do now? You know, last week we read the scripture where they said, fighting Jesus the way they were, this is getting us nowhere. See how the whole world has gone after him? Their plots were ended. Their great dreams were vanish, or would vanish. Think also about the devil. Do you think the devil wanted to get rid of Jesus? Do you think it was maybe the devil who was influencing those religious people and even Judas to to take Jesus and to have him crucified? Do you think it may have been uh, uh, Satan who was helping the crowd to cry out, crucify him, crucify him? I think the devil was all over that story. And when Jesus was dead... And they put him in the grave. I think the devil was happy as anybody could ever imagine. I wanted to take over heaven myself. I wanted to ascend to the throne room of heaven. Me, Lucifer. And now I'm getting my chance because I've taken out the Son of God. And the resurrection changes that. The resurrection stands as evidence that the devil is done. His days are numbered. He still causes all kind of havoc in our world today. But his days are numbered. His number is coming up soon. 
There's a place for him. God made a special place for him because of his rebellion. And he calls it hell. And that's where he will end up. He's not been there yet. The devil has not been to hell yet. He, the Bible says that the devil is the god of this world. He is still around the planet earth. He's still doing his damage now. It's later on he's going to end up in hell. And the certainty of that took place because of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Jesus could overcome all of that. Think of the change that that meant for people who were trusting in him, his disciples, his followers, where they were so dejected and they scattered at the time of the crucifixion. They didn't want to hang around him. Peter denied even knowing who Jesus was three times. And they scattered in fear. And now we're going to see them starting to come back together. And the world is going to be shaken by what happens next with the disciples. That all changed. That all started going the right way because Jesus rose from the dead. Think also about the change that that meant for you and me. If it were not for Jesus coming back to life, he would have been another fake philosopher, fake teacher, somebody who tricked us into following him. And when they put him in the ground, our hopes would be dashed. But Jesus came back to life again. And I think, Jim, you mentioned, didn't you, about there were even 500 people that saw him? I mean, there were witnesses all over the place. There were skeptics who became believers after they saw him. So we have all of this that took place that comes back to the disciples to say, don't be afraid. Jesus has overcome. Jesus is the victor. And he's got your victory in store too. So don't give up. When things look the worst, don't give up. That's still a good message for us these days, by the way. Think finally about how this makes a big difference for you and me. What if, what if I had not come to know the Lord when I did as a 14-year-old boy? Where would life have gone for me? I don't know, but I don't think I would have liked it. You know what I mean? You know, who knows what marriage I would have wrecked? Or who I might have run over when I would be drunk? Or who knows the kind of stuff that uh, people I've hurt or the things I've taken? Who knows the kind of stuff that I would have done? Because I wasn't living for the Lord, I can tell you that. But when Jesus got a hold of my heart, and that was his demonstration to me that he has resurrection power because he started changing me right then. And he's still changing me. He's still working on me. That's all made possible because Jesus rose from the dead. So you think about all of these things that changed. They all changed because he walked out of that tomb. He walked out. And it's so important for us to realize what that means. Let me take you over to John chapter 20. John chapter 20. This is another uh, version of the story. This is the, John's account of the resurrection. And you get down to uh, verse 6. Then Simon Peter, who was behind John, arrived and went into the tomb. He saw the strips of linen lying there, as well as the burial cloth that had been around Jesus' head. The cloth was folded up by itself, separate from the linen. Now that's an interesting phrase. Why is that in there? Here is a whole sentence about the face cloth that was over Jesus when they buried him. Why did, is there so much attention given to that face cloth? Now, if you go to uh, Bible school and start studying for the ministry, they'll teach you how to exegete scripture. Exegete means you learn how to tear things apart. So you find out, okay, here's this uh, passage of scripture. 
Is it referencing some other one? Is there a cross-reference that it's like this over here? Where were these words used over there? What kind of geography was there? And what was the map like? And what were the people living like? You, to exegete means you just dive into a passage until you can absorb every nugget out of that. There was a little bit of a study that came in my last round of schooling about exegeting images. And this one stands out to me as a rich one. The face cloth that had been around Jesus' head was folded up by itself, separate from the linen. What do we know about linen? What do we know about the face cloth? There would have been something like this dining room uh, napkin that would have been put over his face. You know, if somebody dies on a battlefield or in a car accident, don't they often take a jacket off or a blanket and they cover their faces? That was the same principle there. They just took a a, a linen cloth and they would cover the face. Now, this was made of linen, it tells us here in, in John chapter 20. Now, a linen, that's a special kind of material. A special kind of material because uh, it comes from, from the flax and they had to beat it and they had to weave it together and they had to uh, turn it into the thread that was used and then to, some of you would know a whole lot better than I do. I don't know the difference between knitting, crocheting, and uh, needlepoint and I don't know how many others there are like that. I, I just know I can't do any of them. You start putting things together and you come up with lace. And it's like, wow, that's really pretty. And you do things there and you end up with a potholder. And if you go too long, the potholder becomes a scarf. You know, it goes too long, it becomes a blanket. (laughs) So I found, with Regina's help, a sweater. Regina has worn this sweater for years. If I remember correctly, with a brown skirt. And it looked It's just lovely. You can tell from the the color of the buttons that it would have gone well that way. She was uh, going to throw this away a few days ago. And I said, why? And she said, well, look at this. It's coming undone. And just like when you do knitting or crocheting or any of those things, if you make a bad knot, You can pull that thing loose and remake the knot, right? You can just keep pulling on that thing. You know what I'm doing? Since she was going to throw this away, it's okay. (laughs) I can just keep pulling on this thing and that thread just keeps unwinding. This is the same kind of process that would have been used to make that linen. You do enough of these over here, and all you end up with is a pile of yarn on the floor. It either is what it is, or it all comes unraveled. Now, the reason I tell you this is to say that's what the resurrection is. And I think that that face cloth helps to make that point. Because if that face cloth made of linen... If it were to become uh, found with uh, ravelings and you started pulling on that, you could unravel that whole thing until there's nothing left. That is a witness to the resurrection. That would have been the first thing to have had physical identification, recognition, or experience with the resurrected Jesus. When Jesus came back to life, That face cloth was the first thing of notice. They took that face cloth and they folded it up neatly and laid it where his head had lain. I think there's such care for that because um, that's the first thing that would have had the presence of Jesus coming back to life. And if you have that unravel, there's nothing left to the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And if the resurrection is unraveling, or if it unravels, there's nothing left of the Christian faith. 
The Christian faith then only becomes a book of stories like Aesop's fables. It just becomes a lot more philosophy and teaching and, oh, here's some neat stories and things like that. But the power of God would be lost. The power of God is there because the thread holds. The thread holds. It has not come unraveled. 2,000 years later, it still holds. It holds not only because we still have the witnesses of God in our world today. You know one of the ones I've come to appreciate in the last few days? Is the, uh, a person's self-consciousness or their, their conscience. People don't have to be told anything. They know when they've done something wrong. You get a two-year-old who sneaks a cookie off of the cookie plate and they are holding it there and then you come along and they put their hand behind their back because they know they weren't supposed to get that cookie. You don't have to be taught right from wrong. Just the simple fact that we have a conscience tells us God is working on our hearts. He gave us part of himself. He gave that because he wants us to recognize our need of him. And we have the testimonies of people like so many of us here who could tell the story of what Jesus personally has done in your life. First of all, in changing you who you are and how you live. In answering prayers for sicknesses and financial needs and all kinds of dilemmas that can come our way. We can tell the stories where God made the difference. People say, well, that was just a coincidence that these nice things happened to you. Well, here's the truth of the matter is, when I pray, coincidences happen. When I don't pray, coincidences don't happen. I think I'd better pray. We have witnesses coming 2,000 years later to say that what this book says is true. And when this book says that Jesus rose from the dead, that means he rose from the dead. He was seen by 500 people. He rose from the dead. The tomb is empty. He rose from the dead. He's still changing lives today. That's the reason we have happy Easter. It's not happy because sun is coming out. It's not happy because we got pastel colors on eggs. It's not happy because Evans has a bunch more of these Reese cups that he can take home since we didn't have enough kids to eat them all up today. It's not a happy Easter because of all of these things. It's a happy Easter because the truth of the reality is Jesus rose from the dead and he is still in the business of raising people up. And just like the song we sang a little bit ago, that the resurrected king is resurrecting me. That's evidence to the resurrection that's still taking place today. Today. Would you turn to a person next to you I hate it when preachers do this, but I'm going to do it anyway. Would you turn to the person next to you and say, he's resurrecting even you today. <laughs> Has it been a while since somebody said something nice to you? Well, I think somebody just said something real nice to you. The king is still resurrecting you and me today. So we have a great victory to celebrate in the Lord. Our music team is going to come back. They're going to lead us in a closing song. But I want you to know, just like that, that facial cloth that was over Jesus' face, folded up so neatly and talked about in John chapter 20, that is an evidence of the resurrection because if it came unraveled, it'd all be over. There'd be nothing left to the Christian faith if the resurrection isn't true. Thank the Lord it is true. Amen. Amen. And he brings us victory now, through our lives, and through all eternity. You've been listening to this week's message from Orange Friends Church in Lewis Center, Ohio. Do you have a question or a comment? Would you like to share your story or how our messages have helped you in your journey with the Lord? We would love to hear from you. Please email us at transformed at orangefriendschurch.org. Join us next week for another relevant Christ-centered message. 
This podcast is a production of Orange Friends Church in Lewis Center, Ohio. For more information, please visit our website at orangefriendschurch.org. Thank you, and have a wonderful week.